Hello, and welcome to the Info Dump. This is the show where I will subject you to the thoughts that are rattling and rambling about in my brain, and sometimes cover things that I wish I didn't know. Today is not one of those times, though. Today, we're going to be talking about the current state of the Five Nights at Freddy's lore. First things first, since what we're covering is horror and horror adjacent, I do want to start us off with a little bit of a content warning. This series deals heavily in death, especially that of children, and some of the images that I will show may be a bit disturbing. Animatronics designed to be scary, for example. If you're not in a good headspace for that, or if this topic is a trigger for you, you may not want to stick around, and there is absolutely no judgment there. Next up on the housekeeping checklist, I want to offer a little bit of clarification about what this video is and what this video is not. This is not an attempt at explaining the lore. God knows there are several other much bigger YouTubers who have already attempted that to varying levels of success. Eh, depends on who you ask. If you want an idea of the timeline or anything like that, I recommend the videos from Rytoast, ID's Fantasy, Game Theory, and Gibby's Good Idea, Bad Idea that I have linked down in the description. This is also not an attempt to bash the series or its lore by any means. I'm a huge fan of this franchise and its story, and I love it even despite its little snarls and flaws. However, I'm also a storyteller by training and trade, so I recognize these flaws with a great deal of clarity. This video is an attempt to look at the state of the canon and continuity of the Five Nights at Freddy's series, speculate as to how we got to where we are, and take a look at what the core of the story is. I want this to be a tool for other writers to demonstrate how sometimes a simpler story is more effective than an impressive but convoluted one. Now, I mentioned canon and continuity, and I know what you might be thinking. Wait, aren't those the same thing? While they have been used interchangeably, especially by the FNAF fandom, there actually is a definitional difference. Canon, as defined by Merriam-Webster, is a sanctioned or accepted group or body of related works, while continuity is something that has, exhibits, or provides continuity, such as A, a script or scenario in the performing arts, B, transitional spoken or musical matter, especially for a radio or television program, or C, the story and dialogue of a comic strip. This means that everything I discuss today will be considered part of the FNAF canon, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's considered part of the main story's continuity. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get into the fun stuff, shall we? Part 1. What is the FNAF canon? The first part of the canon is the games, those being Five Nights at Freddy's 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 3, FNAF 4, FNAF World, FNAF Sister Location, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, also known as FNAF 6, Ultimate Custom Night, Freddy in Space 2, FNAF Help Wanted, FNAF Help Wanted The Curse of Dreadbear, FNAF Special Delivery, also known as FNAF AR, Security Breach Fury's Rage, FNAF Security Breach, FNAF Security Breach Ruin, Freddy in Space 3, Chica in Space, and FNAF Help Wanted 2, the most recent edition. There are 11 games that are considered to be in the main series, the ones that are underlined. The others are either spin-offs or special cases. Something to faz bear in mind is that a game's status as a spin-off does not necessarily lock it out of continuity. Like, you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't think that at least elements of FNAF World and most of Ultimate Custom Night belong as part of the story. The special cases are games Scott made for charity, an apology, and a promotional stunt. Next, we have a few websites. Yes, the websites are canon. Those websites being Scott Games, FNAF World, and Security Breach TV. They mainly hosted like teasers for the upcoming games, but sometimes things went a little deeper. Next up are the books. 
As of this recording, there are three full-length novels, 12 volumes of the Fazbear Frights anthology series, eight volumes of the Tales from the Pizzaplex anthology series, four guidebooks, one activity book that ended up having lore implications, a film novelization, and a partridge in a pear tree. Last up, as you might have guessed from the term film novelization, there's a movie with at least rumors of several sequels to come. This is, to put it mildly, a lot. But thankfully, figuring out how all of this fits into the continuity should be perfectly simple. Right? Right? Part two, what is the FNAF continuity? When it comes to the games, it really depends on who you ask. By the way, get ready for some graphics because there's no way that this is going to make sense without some visual representation. Anywhere from only the first four games to all 17 of the games out as of the writing of this script and recording of this video could be considered within continuity. I found about three different views on the subject. The first view is what I like to call four games, one story. It's based on a message from Scott that was read during a Game Theory live stream. At the time, it was marketed as the final chapter. I guess Scott changed his mind because, as you saw earlier, there were several more after this final chapter. The next few I would call FNAF 1 through 6. FNAF 6 had a fantastic ending speech that seemed to cap off everything that came before. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth, if you still even remember that name. But I'm afraid you've been misinformed. You are not here to receive a gift, nor have you been called here by the individual you assume, although you have indeed been called. You have all been called here, into a labyrinth of sounds and smells, misdirection and misfortune. A labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. You don't even realize that you are trapped. Your lust for blood has driven you in endless circles, chasing the cries of children in some unseen chamber, always seeming so near, yet somehow out of reach. But you will never find them. None of you will. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. I am remaining as well. I am nearby. This place will not be remembered, and the memory of everything that started this can finally begin to fade away, as the agony of every tragedy should. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still, and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace, and perhaps more, waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. My daughter, if you can hear me, I knew you would return as well. It's in your nature to protect the innocent. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms, the way you lifted others into yours. And then, what became of you? I should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear. Not my daughter. I couldn't save you then. So let me save you now. It's time to rest for you and for those you have carried in your arms. This ends for all of us in communication. Not everyone agrees that this is the best ending, but it does seem to serve as a nice mic drop for the series. I sure hope nothing comes in to undo everything in it. <sighs> the last view is something I would call Main Series Plus, which treats Help Wanted and Beyond as a sort of soft reboot. The exact softness of the reboot is unclear, especially with Help Wanted establishing a kind of alternate history. Welcome to the Freddy Fazbear Virtual Experience. Fazbear Entertainment is excited to join the digital age, and what better way to do that 
than with an edge of your seat virtual reality experience. We know that Fazbear Entertainment has developed something of a bad reputation over the last few decades, and while it's true that some stories associated with our name were loosely based on actual events, the majority of them were total fabrications from the mind of a complete lunatic. Lawsuits pending. But we aren't above laughing at ourselves. Ha, ha, ha. That's why we have recreated many of these completely fictitious scenarios, lies, that you've been fed over the last several years into a hilarious VR game in the hopes that we can finally move past these childish ghost stories and develop a new relationship with you as well as your kids. Don't forget the merch perfect for birthdays. So sit back and enjoy a few scares. Yeah, so the photo of the complete lunatic who created the indie games in that opening, that's Scott Cawthon, the creator of FNAF. This has led a section of the fan community to speculate that every game that came before Help Wanted was a game in-universe, and therefore not in continuity anymore. <sighs> this view is supported by one of the stories in the Tales from the Pizzaplex books. Don't worry, we'll get there. I do want to touch on the spin-offs very quickly before I move out of the games section here. FNAF World would fit under the second view, as it sets up elements of sister location and has a hidden game mode that interacts with FNAF 3. Ultimate Custom Night would fit under the same view, portrayed as a hell for William Afton after the events of FNAF 6, and serves as an epilogue where the man behind the slaughter finally gets his due. Special delivery is tough to place. There's a lot to do with Remnant, which fits with William's plan in the earlier games, but there's also some cut content that seems to have been an influence on, or at least seems related to, the post help wanted storyline. However, it is cut content. Without knowing why it was cut, its connection to the continuity is tenuous at best. The side-scrollers don't really fit within the continuity, and I don't think they were designed to. However, they do contain enemies that connect to the fan community. For example, we have the Mad Theorists, modeled after Matt, Pat, Stephanie, and at the time, very little baby Ollie uh, from the Game Theorists YouTube channel. Dreamgeist, referencing Game Theory's infamous Dream Theory, and this thing from the merch hell stage of Chica in Space, modeled after a notoriously bad piece of merch. Freddy in Space 2 and its sequel owes its name to a reference to a minigame from FNAF World's Halloween update. FNAF 57, Freddy in Space. Overall, they show that Scott is not above poking fun at himself and laughing with the audience that he's cultivated. The websites aren't exactly in continuity, but they do provide information about it, and occasionally, very very rarely, participate in it. In the early days especially, Scott would hide a lot of lore in photos that he posted to his website. Take, for example, this teaser for FNAF 3. Seems pretty intriguing, I mean you've got a box of animatronic parts and a big old 3. Nothing too important though, right? Well, if you brighten the image and look to the right of the frame, you see a certain stinky rabbit man. This was the first look at a character who would quickly become a fan favorite, Springtrap. There were also story elements hidden in the source code of Scott's websites. One example of this came in the lead up to FNAF 6, where the Scott Games and FNAF World websites talked to each other. You, you are, are crowding, crowding us. us. Be quiet. You, you can't, can't tell, tell us what, what to, to do, do anymore. Yes, I can. You will do everything that I tell you to do. We, we outnumber you. This is one of those cases of the website actually participating in the continuity 
as it explains why Ennard, from Sister Location, was broken up into Molten Freddy and Scrap Baby for the very next game. Security Breach's pre-release era gave us something that was a little bit Scott Games teaser, and also a little bit new. Security Breach TV was the home for a short series of cartoons called Freddy and Friends on Tour. The series, which was in the style of Hanna-Barbera cartoons like Scooby-Doo, housed teasers for characters who would appear in Security Breach, such as the daycare attendant and DJ Music Man. Freddy and Friends on Tour became part of the story when it was shown on a TV in a highly lore-relevant room in Security Breach, as well as featuring on collectibles in Security Breach's DLC, Ruin. Now the books! Oh god, the books. Okay, so the books are complicated. The Silver Ice trilogy contains elements that shed light on things on the games without being in the game's continuity themselves and a lot of people were confused by this. So in a Steam community post, Scott attempted to add some clarity. He described the novels as, quote, separate continuities, even if they do share many familiar elements. So yes, the book is canon, just as the games are. That doesn't mean that they are intended to fit together like two puzzle pieces. The book is a reimagining of the Five Nights at Freddy's story, and if you go into it with that mindset, I think you will really enjoy it." End quote. This was a lot of people's introduction to the thought that canon and continuity could be different things. Fazbear Frights represented a turn towards even more confusion. Scott once again tried to explain it in a Steam community post, this time saying, quote, "...this will be very different from the original book series, as it will be a collection of short horror stories that takes place in the FNAF universe. The series will launch with five books, each containing three different short stories with unique characters and plot lines, some connected directly to the games, and some not." The wording of that last line, some connected directly to the games and some not, has led to a fan theory that the overarching epilogue story about the Stitch Wraith and the short stories that tie into it are the ones that are connected to the games because there is a potential answer to a question that has stumped the community for a while now. How or why could more than one spirit inhabit Golden Freddy? The Tales from the Pizzaplex series probably has the most complex relationship to the continuity out of any of the books I've discussed. This series seems more closely tied to the game's continuity. However, there are some wacky concepts or concepts that aren't explored in the games that show up in the books. Several of the stories feature attractions within the mall that don't seem to have any evidence for their existence within Security Breach, such as a role-playing arena and a number of VR and AR attractions. Those who believe Tales games, or the theory that these books 100% take place in the main game's continuity, often argue that these attractions often fail spectacularly within the story in which they're introduced, which could explain why these things don't show up in Security Breach. Others instead prefer to think of these stories as providing parallels to events in the game, especially when considering elements related to the epilogue story's antagonist called the Mimic. Another point for the Tales games crowd comes in the story Help Wanted. If you've been paying attention, that title should be ringing a few bells. Help Wanted follows an indie game developer who is approached by Fazbear Entertainment and strong-armed into creating video games for them. This is where that picture of Scott Cawthon from the VR games intro comes back into play. The last book I want to discuss is a doozy, The Survival Logbook. From the very beginning, we see that this book belonged to someone else. Mike. Anytime you see something in red pen, it's implied that Mike wrote or drew it. Mike seems to have been around for the events of Sister Location, as evidenced by the sketches of the Fazbear Entertainment Cash and Exotic Butters gift baskets from that game and other Sister Location references sprinkled throughout the book. He also may have been the player character in FNAF 4, given that he responded to a prompt asking about his recent dreams with a damn good sketch of Nightmare Fredbear only missing the accessories. 
Mike's writing isn't the only writing present in the logbook, though. This faded text comes to us courtesy of Cassidy, a spirit whose name was revealed in a word search in this book. On this page, they are asking, was your favorite childhood toy a plastic purple telephone? This telephone is something we see in the bedroom in FNAF 4. So Cassidy may be talking to Mike, or they may be talking to another spirit. This spirit, as yet unnamed, much to the community's chagrin, speaks by altering text in the book, as we can see most clearly by putting these two Rate Your Feelings pages next to each other. The third feeling changes from health to I can hear sounds. And the last feeling changes from existential dread to it was for me. This last change seems to respond to a statement from Cassidy, the party was for you. Because of the connection to a party, many theorists who read this book believe that the text changing spirit is that of the crying child who suffered the bite of 83 at his birthday party. This child is also theorized to be Mike's younger brother. And taking it one step further, both Mike and Crying Child are theorized to be the sons of William Afton, the series killer. Leaving the books behind, now let's talk the movie. The movie seems to be taking a page from the novel's book, presenting a reimagining of the Five Nights at Freddy's story rather than a direct adaptation. Here, some familiar characters have had their origins and relationships somewhat shuffled. Mike Schmidt is not Michael Afton working under an alias, something the fandom has theorized since the logbook. Instead, he is the brother of one of William's first victims. The atoning child role is instead filled by Vanessa, who is named and or modeled after a character from Security Breach. If this is the same Vanessa, that means the timeline is very different from what we thought it was. Part 3. What's the big deal, anyway? Now that I've spent nearly half an hour talking about this, you may rightly be wondering, why? Why am I so concerned about the clarity of a video game storyline? And the answer to that is simple. It didn't have to be this complicated. <laughs> this could have been a simple, straightforward story. Man loses family, goes on a killing spree, dies in a fire. Easy enough. Instead, we have contradictions of which of his children died first, when all of this is happening, how much of the surrounding canon we take into consideration when building the continuity. The more clarifying details and soft reboots we add, the harder it is to understand the story at the core of this whole thing. And yeah, I'm aware Scott didn't necessarily intend for this to be a whole thing. Once the first game took off, he had to figure out puzzles for the pieces he'd put in place. This fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants style of storytelling just doesn't make for a very cohesive narrative. And cohesion is one thing that helps an audience best understand the story that's in front of them. Without cohesion, we have a situation like this, where no one is sure how many games are considered to be the main story, or where and to what degree the series has been rebooted, or how much weight we should give to the books. Are they simply parallels, or are they within the game's continuity? This isn't to say that a writer should pander to an audience, dumb their work down, or write something that they don't want to write, simply because the audience demands. It's to say that storytellers, game developers, etc., should have goodwill towards their audience. And one way to show that goodwill is by not making things more convoluted than they need to be. I do have an addendum here, because most of this script was written prior to the release of Help Wanted 2, so there is a bit of updated information. Help Wanted 2 presents two endings, both of which present somewhat straightforward answers to some big questions, especially ones that had cropped up in the post-Help Wanted area of the canon. Uh, spoilers, by the way. In what I would call the standard ending, the player collects these six Transformer-style toy robots modeled after Freddy Fazbear and Co. And after all six of them are collected, and you barely get a glimpse of the, the big final 
combined Voltron looking thing. You then see the player character seemingly get turned into a staff bot, like from Security Breach. Specifically, the player then takes the point of view of Maskbot, who gives Cassie the V-A-N-N-I mask at the beginning of the Ruin DLC. This could be to connect the player character of Help Wanted 2 with Cassie. Are we playing as Cassie's dad? I think so, but that's for another show. In the other ending, what I would call the secret ending, you go around collecting these little like memory plushies, poppets, not entirely sure what to call them, but you collect them by doing specific tasks within the mini games after being given clues by the great, powerful, and semi-reliable Mystic Hippo. After collecting all of them, you then get to play the Princess Quest game within a game that's been a part of this series since the mobile port of Help Wanted. And you play it first through an arcade cabinet, and then you get to experience it in VR. Towards the end of the VR Princess Quest section, the player is faced with a familiar puzzle, one set in a graveyard that featured in an earlier iteration of Princess Quest. This puzzle in its earlier version featured gravestones with different numbers of yellow dots on them, um, indicating a numerical order, and braziers in front of the graves that you could light up with a swipe of the sword. This version is a little bit different, because in addition to those features mentioned earlier, you also have the little memory poppets. What's really interesting here is that if you light up the braziers in any order, you'll get to progress. If you light them in the correct numerical order, you unlock a secret treasure room with a single treasure chest inside. Inside the treasure chest is a Bonnie mask, one that looked familiar to a lot of players and viewers of the game because it had featured in the Help Wanted DLC Curse of Dreadbear, but also as an AR collectible in Ruin, the entry just before Help Wanted 2. In Ruin, that mask, along with other Bonnie-themed merch, was linked with Cassie's dad, as Cassie said that Bonnie was his favorite character. This link, along with the fact that the line, this looks familiar, pops up when you first see the Bonnie mask in Princess Quest, is what led a lot of folks to believe that the player character here is, in fact, Cassie's dad. What's really interesting, even more interesting than the Bonnie link or anything else that we've talked about before, is the fact that those little memory poppets that we collected in order to get to this point, in order to get to this ending, are here. They're sitting on the gravestones. And they're wearing masks that line up with the original Fazbear lineup, plus Golden Freddy and the puppet. And remember, I said there was a numerical order that unlocked the Bonnie chest. That numerical order may provide us with the death order from one of the first events in the series, something we have been begging for. We've been begging for information about this for nearly a decade. All, like, a decade now. And we finally get it. It's still a little vague, to be sure, but it's so much clearer than anything else we've gotten. I think Rytoast said it best in in an episode of the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza podcast that came out around the time they were finishing up Help Wanted 2. I don't know what prompted the missing child incident, and I will get into what I think might be. But after the missing child incident, the security puppet is made. That tracks. That makes a lot of sense to have the security puppet be made after the missing child incident. You would need security. Something's going on. Then Charlotte Emily dies. Now, Henry Emily probably leaves the franchise. With it, so does the security puppet. Or at least it's downgraded to not be a security puppet anymore. And without a security puppet, the crying child dies. That that domino of events makes a lot of sense. And then after the crying child dies, you make the fun times Elizabeth dies. 
looking at this timeline, it makes perfect domino effect sense to go Mystic Child Incident, Security Puppet, Charlotte Emily, No Security Puppet, Crying Child, Fun Times, Elizabeth Afton. That makes perfect logical sense. But then there's one fucking problem. Why does the Missing Child Incident happen in the first place? To borrow one of the more confusing phrases from earlier on in the franchise, the pieces were in place for us. And while, yeah, there are definitely still some vagaries and issues and problems, I think that after a decade, we may finally get to put them all together. Thank you all for watching, if you made it this far, and I hope you enjoyed this. My sources, as well as the links to the videos I mentioned back at the beginning, are down in the description, so go give those videos a watch if you haven't already. Like this video if you liked it, and share this video if you think friends and family would enjoy it, or if you want to torture them by subjecting them to this info dump. I'm not sure if this will become a regular thing, or when the next one would be if it does, but the best way to find out is to subscribe and ring that bell. Anyway, I hope you all had as much fun watching this as I had making it, and I wish you all a very fond Faz Farewell.